Therefore, so what he said is, all the laboring I've been doing in words and chapters, I've been laboring to let you know that this salvation in Christ is not by works. It is through faith in the Son of God. You are you no longer have to depend on trying to fulfill this law that you can't fulfill no way. So what I'm letting you know now is therefore, since you understand this, know that there is no condemnation. No. But see, that no is not just a regular no. It's not like if your daughter say, can I have a soda? No, not right now. It's more like your daughter coming to you and she's 15 saying, can I have sex with my boyfriend? No. (laughs) No. Your son coming to you at 15 years old. Daddy, can I, can, I, can I buy a gun so I can shoot somebody? No. It's a serious no. It's not your average no. So what he's saying, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You will not be condemned even though we deserve it. We will not be condemned. Sin deserves punishment. Sin will be punished. And all of us are sinners. Do you understand that? Everybody in here is a sinner. But <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I'm in here. I'm part of everybody. <laughs> but condemnation is a place of punishment. And sin has to be punished. And understand that we are not righteous. The Bible says there is no one righteous, not even one. Not even one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. David said, surely I was sinful at birth from the time my mother conceived me. This is the same man who is shepherding sheep and writing psalms, praising God and everything. He even knows that from the time he was born, he was sinful. And sin has to be paid for. So when you are in Christ, you do not You are not going to get the wrath of God anymore because you have accepted a sacrifice from Jesus Christ on a cross who has paid the penalty of sin. We are free because he frees us from not only the penalty of sin, but the power of sin over our lives. So it's a double part here. I'm no longer going to face the punishment or the condemnation, and you're going to take me out of this sinful jail that I was in. I'm no longer going to be bouncing back and forth off the walls of sin because you've opened the door, you've unlocked the door, and you have freed me so I can get out now. The judge is no longer going to call me guilty. Only because I have faith in the Son of God. Only because. And it's important that we remember that, that we remember that. Don't let the enemy try to tell you that you're going to hell because you made a mistake. The Bible said there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Too many times we make mistakes, we repent, and we go on, and the devil still has us thinking that we're going to hell. If it was based on what you was going, what you did or based on works, you wouldn't have been able to get there no way. Because the scripture doesn't say that it, the law was fulfilled by us, but it said in us. And it's in us because we had the Holy Spirit in us. And Christ died for us and he gave us the Holy Spirit. So now Christ is in us and the law is fulfilled in us. Amen. Not by us. Amen. In us. Not by us. Amen. Verse 2 says, because through Christ Jesus... The law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. The spirit is life. The spirit, he is life in himself. Once he comes upon you, you have life. You have new life. Now, you don't have that old life. You are now vibrant. You are not bound to sin anymore as you were before. We're not walking dead men and women anymore now when you come to Christ. We're not walking around dead. We are walking around Life with life in us, not lifeless, but we are full of life now because the spirit of life has come on us now. And this is all a part of that coming to Christ and understanding that you are not condemned anymore. Because he is life in himself. Do you want real life? Do you want to walk around shameless? Do you want to walk around and be free to praise God? We just had a party. But we had one of those parties where we can go tell whatever happened in the party. 
You know, we're, we're in the world. We go to these parties. We got the, we got the high stuff from our friends, from our parents and stuff. Stuff that you just don't want nobody to know because at that party you was doing stuff you wasn't supposed to do. But when you come to Christ, you can party and tell everybody and invite anybody you want. This isn't a private party. Because we are having a party and it is full of life. It's not full of death. Yeah. The spirit of life set me free. Yeah. Life has set me free. <sighs> Delivered from the power and penalty. From the power and penalty. Just think about that for a minute. Just think about it. Think, think about all the stuff you've done. All the lies you've told. Think about the things that only you and one other person might know. All of that is forgiven. It's forgiven in Christ. In Christ it is forgiven, but it's only in Christ. Yes, sir. It's only in Christ. There's nowhere else. You can't forgive yourself. I tried it before. <laughs> it don't work. Because I'm back in the same situation. But it is only in Christ that you are forgiven. All your works apart from Christ, even if you think they're positive. Even if you think they help somebody. It's, it's for the moment. It's, it's not eternal. It's temporary. I don't want things temporary no more. I want things eternal. I serve the eternal God. The eternal now God is who we serve. And we want to make sure that we are living in that reality. We have been set free. You are free. Understand that you are free. Christ is not looking at you trying to figure out if you're good enough for salvation. He's not. He's not analyzing you trying to see do you qualify. Wouldn't be one person in heaven if you had to qualify. One, per, not one, right. not even one. It gets better. It, 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 it gets better. It gets better. Verse three and four. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. So he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met and us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Now, look how gracious God is right here. Yes. Just, just, just picture this. God is God. He knows he hates sin. He knows the wrath that he's going to have on sin. Okay? He knows this. It, it's nothing to be played with. You haven't faced nothing close to God's wrath. Okay? I don't, I don't care how many shootouts you've been in. I don't care how, 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 how many days you spent in prison. I don't care how tough you've been beat up. Nothing compares to the wrath of God. But what he does is he pours out all his wrath on himself. Not only that, he comes down from heaven. Wraps himself in flesh, what we have. Gives himself the feeling in everything that we have. Because the Bible says he is tempted in every way we were. So he's going through what we go through, but he's God. But so he comes down. He gets on a cross. Start before the nails. Just start building up to that point. The beatings. The floggings. Imagine being hit with a metal ball with spikes on it. A metal ball. And then have to face a cross. But he did this so that the law would be fulfilled. But he did it for us. So now he's on a cross. Spikes. Through his wrists. Through his feet. Thorns on his head. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about these, these uh, blackberry thorns. These little, you know, these, you know where, you, where you just, ouch. No. <laughs> I'm, talking, I'm talking about real ones. Thick ones on his head. He gets on a cross. Bleeding, dying, thirsty. Think of yourself up there. But not only that, he pours out his own wrath on himself. So he can meet the requirements of the law so we can be free. Had nothing to do with him. Nothing because he is God. 
But what he did was what we deserve. He took upon himself so that the righteous requirements of law might be met in us, not by us. You can't do it. See, the law, you know what's wrong with the law is that it only shows you your sin. That's all it does. It doesn't produce righteousness. It only shows us our unrighteousness. It shows us how sinful we are. Paul goes through this battle. Is the law sin? Certainly not. I wouldn't have known what sin was. But he goes back and he's this battle. Then he comes to his sisters and says, but guess what? Thanks be to Jesus Christ who died for me on a cross. Now I can be free to live life vigorously and don't have to worry about being in this sin tuggle anymore because he's freed me. Yes, sir. Yes, he has freed you. Yes, yeah. Understand that. Yeah. But see, when we go along, when we go further through this passage, what we go understand is being free comes with a life of living like we're free. Yeah. Okay? See, see, the thing is this. When we go, let me, let me go there. Let me go first so I won't explain ahead of myself. Let, let, so I won't explain ahead of myself. Let's go on down to verse 5, and I'm, I'm going to be quiet after this, after we run through this piece right here. Pray for me. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. I'm in verse 5. But those who live according, in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. This does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. This is what he says here, though, now. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. You cannot be saved and don't have the spirit of God in you. Amen. Understand that. Yes, sir. You cannot be saved and not have the Holy Spirit living within you. So if the Holy Spirit is living in you, you are no longer controlled by the sinful nature. Amen. What Paul is getting, he's getting straight here is, that let's, let, let's break it down. Let's go from worldly thinking to Christian thinking. Okay. Worldly, cr- worldly thinking versus Christian thinking. I'm going to tell you, worldly thinking triggers sinful desires. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sinful desires equal fleshly decisions. And fleshly decisions equal death. Thinking according to the flesh is only going to make you go deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. But what he said is that since you are not controlled by that nature anymore, you should be coming out. I heard somebody tell me, I didn't fall out of heaven, I crawled out of hell. It's kind of theologically incorrect because I didn't didn't crawl nowhere. God saved me and snatched me out and set me on solid ground. But, but the thing is, we need to be making progress going towards righteousness because the sinful nature goes that way. God's spirit goes this way. Yes. When God's spirit is in us, we go this way. It's still a little tug. But guess what? When you are in Christ, it should be harder to make a sinful decision now. Okay, before, before I was saved, it was quick to make a, I was quick to make a sinful decision. Should I get drunk? Yes. <laughs> should I date this girl sleep with her? Yes. You know, should, uh, you know, should I cuss him out? Yes. Should, should, I, should I cheat on this test? Yes. Quick. Now, when that comes up, it's like, hold on, no. Let me think about it. No, I can't do that. But if I do do it, I have to contemplate now. Because I have this nature that wants to go this way now. So I can't just submit to the sinful nature anymore because I have the spirit of God in me. The spirit of God will not allow you to just continually, continually submit to the sinful nature. That's why it says if the spirit of God lives in you. We need to make sure. In Galatians. Somebody go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5 and verses 19 through 21. And it's going to show us if our lives are characterized by this. Dare not say the spirit of God lives in you. I'm saying characterize them now. This is your pattern. This is what goes on. This is what not only I can see, but everybody else can see. Can I get a reader for that, please? I, 
I, I got it deep. I got it. <laughs> Let me get over there. Here, here we go. I got it. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who live like this, when the spirit of God is in you, you will not live like that. We will not live like that. I will not live like that because the spirit of God doesn't live like that. The spirit of God doesn't lead you down what he hates. But guess what? The thing about this is this ain't really a big time struggle. What it is is if the spirit of God is living in you, you're dominated by him. Your Christian thinking is dominated by the Holy Spirit. Dominated. That's why I say it's not easy to make a sinful decision when you are in Christ. It's not. But it's the progression, it's the sanctification pro progression that I'm talking about here. When you are a Christian, these, this is the way you're going to go. You're going to go opposite of the sinful nature. You read a little more. Galatians 5 again. You, you go down to verse 22. This is what Christian thinking is now. Christian thinking is dominated by the Holy Spirit. And don't look at this and think you have one of these and say, okay, well, I'm fine. Because it's not an S on this fruit. It's not an S. This is a package deal. You don't go on vacation and get your suitcase and just put socks in it and think you, you fully packed. You need everything. You need everything. But it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Is your life and my life characterized by the fruit of the Spirit? If the Spirit is living in us, shouldn't our lives be characterized by the Spirit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But our problem is we're trying to work for it too much. We, we, we try to work for it. I heard Salah tell me one time, he said, man, you never see an apple on a tree straining to grow. <laughs> you, 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 it, it just it sits there and it absorbs the nutrients from the water, from the roots, and from the vines, and it just grows until it's ripe. See, but if we would learn that faith is it's a free gift, Salvation is a free gift. And when we get salvation, the Spirit of God comes, makes his home inside of us. And we now need to just relax and follow his guidance. The problem comes when you think you know too much. The problem comes when we think we can do certain things to please God. And that's what it takes. But when we think that, we are thinking fleshly. And when our mind is fleshly, we cannot please God. What does it say? The sinful mind is hostile to God. The sinful mind thinks he can please God without Jesus. It don't work. Those who are controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. What he is saying is this. If you do not have Jesus Christ, you cannot please God. Bottom line. The only way to please Jesus Christ is to have him in you. The only way to appease God's wrath, the only way to escape it is to accept the free gift of salvation. Amen. And the only way for us to know if we have that gift is if we are following behind the Holy Spirit, yeah. keeping in step with him. Yeah. Since, since, we live by, since we walk by the Spirit, let us live by the Spirit. Right. Pastor taught us a couple weeks ago when it says, let us, it's a command. And anything God commands, he gives you the power to do. He gives you the power to do it. We have to, have to understand that we are free now. The bottom line to our sinful acts is either we are not saved. Okay, I said it. I said it. We are either we are not saved or we don't understand we're free. But when you rewind it back. 
Paul writes this text like this is what happens when the spirit of God is in you. He's not saying you get saved in these and then and then choose what you want to do. Do you want to be over here? You know, or do you want to be over here? No, he's saying once you understand that you are saved by faith and faith alone in Christ Jesus and that there is no condemnation, that you will not be punished. The results are that you walk in step with the spirit now. Yeah. Not that yeah. you walk perfect. Yeah. Not that you walk perfect, but you walk in step with yeah. the spirit. Hey, if you, if you can go out and do things you want to do and don't okay with God, and then you can just live against God's word where it blatantly says, don't do this, don't do that. When you can go against God's absolutes at, at will and don't care, sleep with who you want to sleep with, date who you want to date, get drunk who you want to get drunk with, lie to who you want to lie with, when, when you can do all that, Cause confusion and discord. When well, you can do all that at will with no conviction, the spirit of God is not in you. It's, it's time. It, it's time to say, Lord, I thought I knew you. But I really didn't because I've been trying to do this thing on my own. And it's only leading me down the path. That's why I said the law was powerless to do what the spirit could do. It was powerless. Power only comes in the spirit. And the spirit is easy to accept Jesus Christ. If you hearing this today yeah. and something is saying, you know, I'm tired of living like that. Some is saying, you know, I've done some shameful things. That's the Holy Spirit saying, come, accept this gift right now. Don't work for it. You can't work for it. He's saying right now, if you've considered yourself a Christian and you've been living like that, what he's saying, he's just giving you a quick checkup saying, no, that's not how we live because the spirit of God is in us. And he doesn't tolerate sin. Even though it's paid for. Even though it's paid for. The Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The only thing that will grieve the Holy Spirit is a sinful lifestyle. A lifestyle away from Christ is what grieves the Holy Spirit. So please today, if you don't know Christ, accept him. If you think that you're not good enough for Jesus, the devil is lying. None of us is good enough. He's good enough. That's why he came in likeness of sinful man and became a sin offering. Thank you for your time. to that temple that was just rebuilt by the returning Jews from captivity and he would make a blessing for the people in that temple. That temple was destroyed in 70 AD. That prophecy cannot be fulfilled any longer. The book is closed. It closed the door for the coming Messiah. Incredible internal, uh, internal evidence. Now in the rest of our time I want to start looking at external evidences I find this very fascinating about science and uh, the Bible. And I'll just say this, that if you take, talk to the naturalist, uh, you take a creationist, um, they're not going to agree on the timing of certain events or how things come into be, but they will agree on a lot of the observations. And uh, here are some just examples. Um, they would agree that um, all that is visible came from what is invisible and that what the Big Bang is all about. And that's exactly what Hebrews 11.3 says. By the way, I'm not promoting the Big Bang Theory here. I'm just saying that they would say that there was an explosion which created uh, energy and mass from nothing. Uh, we read that before creation, time did not exist. There's actually four verses in the New Testament that would support that. The universe continues to expand. A number of verses have that uh, in the Bible. Job 9.8 is one of them. It's continuing to expand out. Uh, we also know that the universe is winding down and it'll eventually wear out. And this is the thermodynamics law of entropy, that the, the order within a system uh, is going to either stay the same or degrade. And so the universe is wearing down, it's wearing out. Uh, the universe has an innumerable number of stars. Genesis 22:17, Jeremiah 33:12. 12. 
Uh, if you have a clear night and you look up, the most that you can count on a clear night is about 3,000 stars, but yet Scripture says there's an innumerable host of stars. And now we know that's true. Um, every star is unique, different in magnitude, 1 Corinthians 15, 41. In the beginning, time, God created the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. And so in Genesis 1, 1, we have a relationship between time, space, and matter. Um, also in Genesis, we get the biological development. And this is, the naturalists would agree with this development. There was first an unconscious life, and then there was vegetation, then the conscious life, sea life, birds, uh, land creatures, and so forth, and lastly, human life. And so the order does not disagree with what we would observe. Now, some specifics. I, I find this really fascinating. The sun has a circular path. This comes out of uh, Psalm 19, 1 through 6. Uh, the skeptics once asserted this verse was incorrect. Uh, they said the sun doesn't travel in a circular path. It's just like the planets. But now we know that it does make a circuit. Um, our solar system is in uh, the outer three-fourths of the Milky Way galaxy. It's between two radial arms, which is very important because if we were in the radial arms, it wouldn't exist. And so we have this nice place between radial arms, and um, basically we're going through, rotating around the Milky Way at about 600,000 miles per hour. So the sun is circulating through the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is also hurtling through space at an estimated speed of 2 million miles per hour. Kind of makes you dizzy when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, here we are, we're turning, we're rotating in the solar system, the sun's rotating around the Milky Way, and we're speeding off into space. But the point here is it agrees with what the psalmist wrote a thousand years before Christ came. Paleontology. Um, I have a lot of document, four chapters on this in, this in the book of Search of God. I just want to hit the highlights here. If you go down through the different strata, you, you'll come to the Cambrian level, and then below that's the Precambrian level. On the top of the Precambrian level, you'll find a few fossils of bacteria and fungi and so forth. When you come to the Cambrian level, they call it the Cambrian explosion. There's an absolute explosion of life. Species from all sizes, uh, some of them go for a while and they stop, and some are still in existence today. But what you don't find is transitional life forms between species. And you find, in a lot of cases, bigger species at the bottom and little ones at the top. And uh, I think that's very fascinating. The fossil record, and um, Darwin, when he wrote Origin of Species, realized this. He said in his book that we don't have the evidence today, but eventually we'll have the evidence. And after 150 years of digging, there still isn't the evidence. There's just a few questionable um, transitional species. But... Uh, when you consider the hundreds of millions of fossils that we have today, there should be hundreds of millions of transitional species, uh, and they're just not there. Uh, in the book, In Search of God, uh, in this four chapters, I probably quote about 85 naturalists, materialists, uh, atheists. Uh, you do not have to quote creationists to, to bring this evidence forth. It doesn't make sense to the naturalist eater. So I just quote the naturalists, and uh, you can see what they have to say. I think it's exciting. You can go over to um, Scotland, and there's a, a tree. I think it's, um, it's over 10 meters long, but it's buried at like a 35-degree angle, and it goes through different strata that would be millions of years in the timeline if, ever, if the naturalist um, model was used. The problem is it's the same tree. And trees don't grow millions of years. In Nova Scotia, there's uh, polystrate fossils which go down through 12 strata. And uh, some of these, they're trees that go up through these 12 strata. There's no bulge marks between the different strata. And in some cases, the roots are at the top. Now, what does that sound like? Hmm, that sounds like a flood to me. That sounds like massive burial and sediments. Um, just incredible evidence if, we're, if we have an open mind. Here's a couple quotes. This is by G.R. Uh, Taylor. By the way, these are, these are not creationists. These are uh, naturalists. The fact that there are subsequently no new phyla have appeared and no new classes and orders, this fact which has been long ignored, is perhaps the most powerful of all arguments against Darwin's generalizations. 
T. Camp says paleontology is now looking at what it actually finds and not what it is told that it's supposed to find. As now well known, most fossil species appear instantaneously in the record, persist for some millions of years, virtually unchanged, only to disappear abruptly. Now, we might agree, disagree with the millions of years, but the, the point here is when you look at the fossil record, there isn't the transitional uh, fossils. Okay, meteorology and oceanography. Uh, 2 Samuel 22.16, valleys exist in the bottom of the oceans. You know, it was thought that the, in olden days that the oceans were kind of like a big vase, you know, a bowl, and it got deeper and deeper as you went out to the middle, and it was just a sand bottom. Well, we know there's valleys in the ocean, and Jonah 2, 5 through 6 tells us there's mountains in the sea. What's the tallest mountain on the planet? Does anyone know? Mount Everest is the tallest mountain above the oceans. There are actually bigger mountains than Mount Everest that start in the middle of the Pacific floor and extend up above the ocean. Isn't that incredible? Just as the scripture says, there are mountains in the sea. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1 6, wind blows in circular paths around the earth. We call these jet screens. Um, David wrote 3,000 years ago, the paths in the sea. And um, this caused a 19th century naval, British naval officer, Matt Fontenay Mori, to explore the oceans and look for these prevailing currents. And he found them and pioneered the science of oceanography. And it revolutionized the sea trade at that time. They would get into these currents. And not only did they have the sails, but they would use the currents to get to their destination faster. He was uh, caused to look for those by uh, reading Psalm 8 8. Torricelli was an Italian um, scientist, and uh, he constructed the first barometer and showed that, the, that their, the air actually had weight. And that agrees with what Job says in 28. Uh, chapter 28, 24 through 25. The earth is circular. We read in Isaiah 40, 22. A water cycle maintains life on the earth. Isaiah 55, 10. Job 36, 27 through 28. Uh, this is one I think is just fascinating. If you remember the story of Job, after uh, these miserable comforters had come to Job in these eight different dialogues, um, the Lord met with Job in a whirlwind. Job had questioned the wisdom of God and, and the use of his power. And so uh, God comes to Job and he says, uh, okay, Job, you, you be, I'll be the student. You show me. How did I do it? And another time he says, okay, you, you question my power. Uh, you know, you try to control just these two uh, creatures, the behemoth and the leviathan. See if you can control them. And Job is, realizes that God hasn't abused his power and he repents. And in this discussion, the Lord asked Job, can you bind the cluster of Pleiates or loosen the belt of Orion? Now, in the wintertime, Orion's belt comes right over the eastern horizon. So it's three stars right in the line. And if you follow those out, maybe a, a fourth of the way across the horizon, they point to a cluster of stars called Pleiates. Um, sometimes they're called the Seven Sisters. There are actually more than seven stars, but these stars are in gravitational lock. They're about 440 light years away. They cannot move apart. They are in gravitational lock. Orion, the constellation of Orion, is made up of stars throughout the Milky Way. The Milky Way is expanding. Orion's belt is actually letting out a notch or two as the centuries go by. It's expanding. Job wrote it 3,500 years ago. Uh, can you lose the cluster of Pleiades? The answer is no, they're in gravitational lock. Can you lose the belt of Ryan? The answer is yes, it's loosening. Isn't that fat and fantastic? That'd be a great place for an amen. Amen, okay. Einstein said this, one thing I've learned in a long time that all our science measured against reality is primitive and childlike. Bill McDonald wrote this, No true finding of science will ever contradict the Bible because the secrets of science were placed in the universe by the same one who wrote the Bible, God himself. But many so-called facts of science are in reality nothing more than unproven theories. And I really believe if the God of the Bible is a true God, 
then everything he writes about creation is something that we are going to observe through science. Now, we may not have a good understanding of it, but it's something that won't contradict what we read in, in Scripture. Our last area of external evidence we'll look at is archaeology. Um, again, if the Bible is God's revelation to mankind, we would expect archaeology to be in agreement with Scripture. And it's not to say that archaeology can prove that the Bible is inspired, uh, but it does prove its historical reliability. So, um, and what we'll see here in just a moment is archaeology has verified a number of ancient sites, civilizations, and characters that are in the, in the Bible. So let's look at a few of these. Um, now, I just pulled this off CNN at the end of last year. This is very recent. It was just discovered in 2007. Um, there was a Michael Jurja. He's a professor uh, in Vienna, and he specializes in the Assyrian archaeolo uh, archaeological um, artifacts. And he was looking in the British Museum where they have uh, a Assyrian exhibit of about 100,000 clay tablets dating back to uh, 600 to about 800 BC. <clears throat> and as he was looking through those, he found a tablet that documented the payment of 0.75 kilograms of gold to the temple in Babylon by Nebo Sarzakim. Now, that may be a name that you don't recognize. Um, but if you look in the book of Jeremiah in 39.3, you'll find that Nebo Sarzakim was one of Nebuchadnezzar's generals that was present at the fall of Jerusalem in 587 B.C. Now, the date on the um, tablet is in the 10th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, which would put it at 595 B.C. That would be the second deportation of the Jews. That would be the, the deportation that Ezekiel was transferred to Babylon, and apparently this Babylonian official took gold from Jerusalem, came to Babylon, he, he gave it to the temple, and he got this clay receipt as a result of returning that gold to the temple. Isn't that pretty good? Uh, Michael Jerza said he thinks this is the most important find of biblical archaeology in a hundred years. Uh, the Hittites were a powerful force in the Middle East from about 2250 to 1200 B.C., well over a 1,000 years. And uh, there was no archaeological evidence for the Hittites until the late 19th century. Uh, archaeologists in uh, Turkey have discovered a city which ended up being the Hittite uh, Empire, capital city, and they discovered a, a massive library of ta uh, tablets, um, 15,000 tablets that they found in this library. And um, even more recent excavations of clay tablets have shown up um, from Assyria in Egypt, which speaks of the Hittites and having this um, battle with Ramses II uh, in the year 1287. So again, until just recently, what, what is really neat about this, if you look back in it, is around the 18... 30s, 1840s, and 50s, the Bible came under a lot of attack. There was a lot of skepticism. And uh, there wasn't really much biblical archaeology before then. And in about 1850, uh, scientists started looking into the ground for evidence uh, to confirm biblical uh, facts that were in the narrative. And so it's really after that time that we see a lot of these uh, findings. Jericho. <coughs> Uh, the current leading archaeologist in Jericho was uh, Dr. Bryant Wood, and he shows evidence when he digged down, the walls of Jericho just didn't decay. There was some catastrophic dis uh, destruction of the walls, and the, the timing of that is within about 100 years. They can place it within 100 years by the soil samples of when uh, Joshua would have came into uh, Israel. Luke's ge uh, geography record um, Sherwin White comments, Luke names 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands without error. And this is a fact that Roman historians have long uh, understood to be true. Very accurate. You go through, like in Gen uh, Luke 3, he gives a, a whole political um, overview of who is in charge in, uh, in the Jews in Jerusalem, the Roman political system, the patriarchs. Uh, Luke is very accurate on these things. 
A Cyrus Cylinder, this was discovered in 1879. It records uh, Cyrus' overthrow of Babylon and his subsequent deliverance of Jewish captives. And again, agreeing with the record that we have in the book of uh, Ezra. Moabite Stone, discovered in 1868 in Jordan, confirms Moabite attacks on Israel as recorded in 2 Kings 1 and chapter 3. Uh, the Lacious Letters, discovered in 1932 through 1938, uh, 25 miles north of Beersheba, uh, describe in detail the attack of Nebuchadnezzar on Jerusalem in 586. It describes the siege. It agrees very well with the details we read in the book of Jeremiah. Ebla Tablets. Um, the skeptics who questioned the existence of biblical cities as Sodom and Gomorrah were silenced by the discovery of the Ebla tablets in northern Syria. This was back in 1974. There's been 17,000 tablets now that have been unearthed. And what I find very interesting about this is there's five of these, or there's Ebla tablets that refer to all five cities in the Jordan Plain at the time that Cheddar Leomer came in and attacked uh, those cities and took Lot as captive. And uh, again, this is in the time of Abraham. It's recorded in Genesis 14. Now, this is what is really interesting. One of the tablets actually lists all, six, all, all five cities in the exact order of Genesis 14-2. The, all five cities in the exact order. And uh, again, many made uh, poke fun at the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah being burnt with fire and brimstone. And then they found these tablets that actually documented the existence of Sodom and Gomorrah. Babylonian Chronicles were found in 1956. These are four tablets that date to 600 B.C. And these tablets record the historical events associated with the rise of the Babylonians to conquer the Syrians, the Egyptians, and then Judah. All these events are well documented in the Bible in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Again, the Babylonian Chronicles confirm the military events such as the Battle of Karshemesh in 605 B.C. as recorded in Jeremiah 46 and 2 Kings 24. Now, here's the summary. Here's the experts in the field that are looking at the archaeological evidence. I just want to read some of these to you. No fact of archaeology so far discovered contradicts the biblical record. John Wiseman. Dr. Joe Kinneman. Of the hundreds and thousands of artifacts found by archaeologists, not one has ever been discovered that contradicts or denies one word, phrase, clause, or sentence in the Bible. Nelson uh, Glick. No archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Dr. William Albright. There can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed substantial historicity of the Old Testament. And keep in mind, at this time, the number of archaeological discoveries relating to the Bible are hundreds of thousands. So I just want to uh, kind of highlight now in, in the conclusion. We've looked at internal evidence. We've looked at the authenticity of Scripture. We've looked at the uniformity of Scripture. We've looked at the prophetic content of Scripture. Um, the Bible is a standout on internal evidence. When we look at the external evidence um, of archaeology, we look at what we observe in science, we see no contradiction to what we read in Scripture. That gives evidence of the truth. Whether the truth is buried in the ground or we're yet to discover it, it's going to agree what God has revealed is true. There's not going to be contradiction. Uh, it's very, in the book... Um, I'm trying to remember which one it is. I think it's the Bible, uh, myth or divine truth. I talk about how the fact that there's not a single archaeological artifact which substantiates the Book of Mormon in the uh, the, the tribes that, that popped up in South America and so forth. And they actually, they've done DNA evidence to show that this couldn't possibly have happened. And so science is not confirming the things that, we, that are uh, told to be true in the Book of Mormon. That shows that it's not correct. So man uses science to converge on reality, but absolute truth rests with God. Uh, science is, we are narrowing in on the truth. Uh, the truth, divine truth, is something that we can't lay hold perfectly because of the way that we observe data is not accurate, our logic systems are not accurate, 
uh, our measurements are not accurate, our interpretations of measurements are not accurate. But as we go along in time, we're narrowing in on the truth. But divine truth is going to be perfect truth, absolute truth. And so as we observe things, we're going to understand that God puts his name on the line, and through what he has said is true in Scripture, and we observe it in true in creation, it proves that God is the God of the Bible, and that the Bible is divinely uh, revealed. And, of course, the ultimate truth that God wants man to know and obey is this. The Lord Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father by me. God says, I give you all this evidence to show you I'm the true God, and this is my revelation. Will you trust me with your soul by trusting my Son? And if all this is true, it should be an easy step of faith to say, God, I'm a sinner. I deserve judgment. I, 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 get, I can have salvation through your uh, free offer uh, by accepting your Son for the remission of my sins. I know that was a whirlwind tour, but hopefully it's been encouraging just to see the evidence that there is to know that the Bible is um, God's Word, it's trustworthy, and we can rest our souls on it. So, I don't know, we may just have a couple minutes. If there's a brother or something that has a question, I'd be glad to try to, to answer that or comment. Maybe someone else has come across some evidence that they think is very interesting. So I'll just uh, see if there's any comments or questions. I know it's kind of hot in here. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for all the evidence that you have shown us. Lord, when we look into your word, we're just in awe of its accuracy. Father, we're thankful that you haven't left us destitute of light, but that you have revealed truth to us, that we might know it, that we might know the truth and be set free, that we might have salvation. And Father, we're so thankful that we uh, have your words to guide us through life, which shows us what you approve of, how we're to live. And we pray, Father, that we would not take this lightly. It is an incredible responsibility to have the truth in our hands and not do anything with it. So, Father, we pray that we be faithful to the truth, study it, know it, obey it, yield to it. We pray you live it out. And doctrine is not something we just cram into our heads, but it should be lived out. We pray, Father, that we would really be excited about your word to us. It's come at an incredible cost. And we pray, Father, we would be faithful to it. Father, I pray for our young people here. I pray, Father, that they would not be detoured into darkness, but they would continue to embrace the truth, embrace the scripture, not be led away by vain philosophies, by traditions of men, but they would understand that there is incredible evidence which shows that the Bible is true. Your word to us, it's trustworthy, and we can rely on it. And so, Father, I pray that you encourage our hearts in each of these matters, and we just pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Sure. Okay, if the Lord be not come, um, tomorrow we're going to be looking, uh, having three sessions on evangelistic uh, training. What I want to do in the first session is give you a lay of the land uh, concerning um, world religion. We're really in an explosion of world religion right now. I've been doing some research in Canada. It's been really good. I didn't know a lot of things about Canada concerning the, the spiritual, the, the religious makeup. And uh, we want to get into what is the purpose of the church, and then we'll get into the Great Commission. In the last two sessions are a lot of practical things for how uh, we can be a witness and a testimony in our communities, both as an assembly, how to reach the lost, and one-on-one. -on -one. We'll do a lot of uh, practical things for um, how to share the gospel, how to handle difficult questions, how to, how to turn a conversation from something that's temporal to something that's spiritual. And uh, what I really hope to show you tomorrow is that evangelism is a lifestyle. And it's not high-pressure sales. All, all we have to do is really show love to people, listen, probe for pain, and, and we'll have an opportunity to share the truth that we know. And um, I was telling uh, the folks last night on the plane here, 
Uh, I'll just share this story. It was really neat how often there's trouble that comes in our life, and uh, it's easy to get discouraged about that. But if we start looking around to what God might be doing, it's quite encouraging. And I was supposed to um, catch a van from Menominee, Wisconsin, to the airport yesterday morning. And uh, this van has run like clockwork for years. I've never had one late van in all the times I've taken it. And I was there. There was one other man um, that was waiting for this van also. And uh, the van didn't show up. Five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, thirty minutes, forty minutes. Well, this other guy says, I've got to hop in my Jeep and go to the airport. I'm going to miss my flight. And uh, he said, you want to come along? I said, sure. I thought, well, the Lord's in this. You know, I'm getting a free ride to the airport. Saved me 29 bucks, by the way. And uh, so I get in this guy, and he's driving pretty fast, but that's okay. I prayed. And, uh, <laughs> and um, he ta- started, uh, he asked me what I did, and we, it was easy to turn the conversation to a spiritual one. He said, well, two guys in suits and ties visited me at my door a couple weeks ago. And he started telling me what they said. Well, these are Jehovah Witnesses. This is what they teach. And it was a natural transition to lead into the gospel. This man listened intently for 45 minutes, uh, asking questions. I gave him uh, some gospel literature. You can pray for him. His name is Jim. And uh, I got his name, and I hope to follow up with him when I get back. But isn't that just like the Lord? Here's a situation that looks like I may miss my flight. And he turns it around for a gospel opportunity, and I get a free ride to the airport. That's just like the Lord. So uh, I'll share some more stories with you tomorrow, but um, I really believe this is something that we, we need awakening on. We cannot continue the way we're going. Uh, we need an awakening, and um, I hope tomorrow you'll be encouraged with some of the, the teaching uh, that we look at. Okay. I'll be up front if anybody wants to ask a question or to talk further. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I've brought. Did